my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Bob Teasel. Dr. Teasel is a professor, School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University, and he was he's the former chair, chief, and current research director of the Department of Phys Med and Rehabilitation. He is a clinical researcher with Lawson Health Research Institute, Parkwood Institute Research, and a director of the Core Research Group. He has authored more than 370 peer-reviewed articles and has been involved in $27 million worth of grants. He has won many awards, including the 2016 Natashan Lecture, leading the annual Stroke Lecture in Canada, 2018 Lawson Impacts Award, Scientist of the Year, and the 2018 Post-Acute Stroke Excellence Award, American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine and National Stroke Association. In 2019, he received the Glenn E. Gresham Visiting Professorship and Lecture in Rehab Science in Buffalo. These are just a few of his recognitions and awards. His research interests include evidence-based practice and complex analysis of the evidence in neurorehabilitation. It is certainly my privilege to present to you Dr. Teasel today with his presentation for us, Moving Beyond Standardization of Care, What is Next in Stroke Rehabilitation? Bob? Thank you very much. I'm gonna see if I can't get my slide up here. There we go. All right. Um, I just Wanted to say at first, I've, you know, I've been in the stroke rehab now for 35 years as a specialist or more, and there's been a lot of change uh, over the years. And I think we're on the cusp of another series of changes. And you'll see that as I go through the 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 research. So I think it's it's a it's it's a time to start getting excited again about stroke rehab. And so they entitled this type "Moving Beyond Standardization of Care: What's Next in Stroke Rehabilitation." I, I uh, I do have some disclosures. I, I did get a um, grant from Allergan. Allergan makes Botox. They're now, um, they're not Allergan anymore, they're Alvi. But uh, I'm not gonna talk about Botox in any great deal. So this is a summary of my talk. So if you don't look at anything else, this would be worthwhile. Um, but I'm just gonna briefly talk about the evidence base for stroke rehab, talk a bit about how standardization of care basically revolutionized stroke rehab in Ontario, talk a bit about intensity, and then talk about nobody's quite sure what to do now that we've sort of worked on the standardization of stroke rehab and kind of give you an idea of where I think things are going to go, the idea of more personalized or customized stroke rehab care. Talk a little bit about uh, two areas around customized care. One is patient preferences and motivation, which I think is really important, which is becoming very big in the literature. And then finally, talk about adjunct therapies um, at some length and some of the research we've done um, looking at the idea of adjunct therapies. So first thing I want to talk about is, is people often don't realize, but stroke rehab really has a tremendous um, evidence base. Um, and um, uh, real uh, opportunities to continue to expand that evidence base. Um, whoops, sorry, I went backwards there. So when you look at stroke rehab, um, uh, we do the evidence-based review. There are probably approaching 4,000 published RCTs in stroke rehab alone. It's an amazing database. I mean, people talk about wanting to practice according to the evidence. Well, there's nothing like stroke rehab in any of the, any of the rehabilitation world that has that kind of evidence base. For instance, uh, traumatic brain injury, which we also review, is about a tenth of what we see in stroke rehab. So with stroke rehab, we have a real opportunity to look at the evidence. We have a tremendous evidence base, and it allows us to try and drive our, or at least think about how we can try and align our, our practices uh, in keeping with the evidence that does exist. Now, one of the things that really, I think, has revolutionized stroke rehab care in Ontario, and we were a big part of it, it started back in um, 19... Uh, around 2000, and actually the stroke rehab evidence-based review started at that time, and we were all part of the, the uh, exciting um, Ontario stroke strategy at that time. And really the, the, the end result of that was the idea of standardization. And that standardization of care, which we didn't have before then, 
has really, really revolutionized stroke rehab care, particularly in Ontario, particularly when combined with benchmarking. And so standardized care is pretty simple. Um, it's interesting because it focuses on key principles. And what makes it kind of unique is there's widespread agreement on these key principles, not just among clinicians and researchers, but also among policymakers and administrators. Everybody kind of got on board. And as a result, we were able to make fairly dramatic changes, which we are now really reaping the fruit of now. Um, although to some extent, we are starting to lose our way a bit, but I mean, those things are easily remedied. So the, basically the, the key elements of standardized care are that patients should be managed on stroke rehab units. In other words, um, they should be organized around care for stroke patients. And so that means that your staff needs to have special training with regard to stroke rehabilitation and not just be um, generalists. And that's kind of a, a concept which we've been able to to practice to some extent in Ontario, they're obviously can't do it everywhere because some of the rehab units aren't large enough, but we try and organize so that, you know, our staff are well trained in stroke rehab. I think that's well accepted. Intensive therapy, we'll talk a little bit about that. As you know, it's the, it's the one that we struggle with the most. Um, accessing rehab early, that one's gone really well, uh, in part because of the pressures on our hospital has kind of sped it up. Task-specific therapy, um, which was not as big an issue 20 years ago as it is now. So that's why that's important. It seems now to be just the norm, but it wasn't uh, 20 years ago. And then access to community-based rehab, the idea of starting to have outpatients to follow up on what's happening. And so, so this whole idea of, of standardization of care along those things, which now seems normal to all of you who are just starting out, um, took a long time for us to develop and implement and has really made a dramatic change in terms of care of stroke patients in uh, in Ontario and Canada and other parts of the world. Now, the one area I'm going to talk a bit about is that intensity of therapy matters, and that's one area where we need to get better. It's, uh, it's easy to say, it's not easy to do, um, but there's a lot of good evidence that intensity of therapy matters a lot, um, and there's numerous people that made um, careful assessments. Uh, the Scottish group who um, um, are big on uh, uh, evidence for evidence uh, found that uh, adequately powered high quality randomized controlled trials confirmed the benefit of high dose of repetitive task practice. Um, the, the Dutch um, actually tried to quantify that, noted that additional therapy time of 17 hours over 10 weeks was necessary to see a positive effect if you're going to increase your intensity. The Canadian stroke guidelines note that stroke rehab patients should get a minimum of three hours of direct task-specific therapy five days a week. Um, in England, it's two and a half, two and a quarter hours. Um, the three hours in Canada was based upon the American standard, was not based upon any real evidence. It was based on the fact that in America, three hours of therapy was the standard of care and they were having better outcomes than us. So the idea was that we picked the three hours because that's what the Americans were doing, but three hours is purely an arbitrary number. Um, and one of the things I emphasize, I recently did a big review of the healthcare system in, uh, in Singapore and stroke rehab, and they kept wanting to tell me that we need to get, these therapists are too expensive. We need to get rid of these therapists. We need to put patients in longer term beds. And I kept saying, you don't understand. Therapists are cheap, beds are not, you know? And by cutting your therapists, all you're gonna do is increase amount of time in beds. And that's gonna cost you much more money than if you kept your therapist. And it's a it's a common problem we run into, um, um, the, the fact that therapists are often considered this, this extra luxury that stroke rehab has without people really understanding that they're critical to the actual functioning of um, the unit and functioning well. Now, one of the challenges we had, and this came out in the Auditor General's report, December of 2021, that you know the guidelines we recommend are three hours a day or 180 minutes of PT, OT, and speech therapy. And in Ontario, we've been able to bump that number up to 69 minutes per day across the uh, province, which is 60% below the anticipated uh, targets. And we were providing across our different sites in Ontario, anywhere from 22 to 110 minutes of therapy, uh, but nobody was really achieving the 180 minutes, which was problematic. Now, when you really look at this thing carefully, one of the biggest issues is staffing. Staffing remains a challenge. Uh, we determined over 20 years ago that if we were gonna be able to achieve the three hours a day, we needed um, 
uh, physiotherapy and OT ratios of six to one and, and speech therapy ratios of one to 15. And in many of our centers, we've just not been able to achieve that. So it has created some real stress for us in terms of trying to meet the, 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 the intensity standards or at least get close to them because um, many centers just don't have the staff to do it. Having said that, there are some centers that do have the staff to do it. And and they went to the five centers uh, that were providing the best care, and they came up with this, this um, a document, which was put out by the Ontario Stroke Strategy or whatever it's called nowadays. Um, and basically, these were some of the ideas that those centers had and how you can improve your intensity. And, 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 and you can read those at your leisure down the road, and it's a nice little two-page document to look at. But basically... It's, it, it, was, it, it came down to people were paying a lot of attention to um, the whole idea of intensity. It became a big part of the culture of the unit. And people realized that in order to maximize the intensity of therapy on their unit, they had to pay attention to the little things. And it was those little details that were absolutely critical. And I'm not going to go into all of those things because um, some of these uh, um, uh, ideas, I'm sure, came from your area or your region. And just to finish up on this, because I think it's the one area where we still have to uh, work on if we want to get uh, provide uh, our patients with optimal care, is a study by Alexander Drommer just before he died, um, fortunately, um, where it, it's called the CPAS study, where what he did was he wanted to figure out what the optimal time to provide intensive therapy was, whether it was in the acute phase, which was in the first 30 days, whether it was in the subacute phase where we provide most of our rehabilitation inpatient wise in the first two to three days, or whether it was in the chronic day, uh, chronic stage more than six months. And so what he did is he provided 20 extra hours of uh, self-selected task specific motor therapy to patients in each one of these three timeframes. And then he had a control group as well. And what he found is on a measure of upper extremity um, a function, which was the action research arm test or the ARAT, the, there was significant and greatest difference in the subacute phase. So providing additional therapy seems to be most effective in the stage where patients are in the rehab unit itself. And that was where they had the biggest bang for the buck. If you're going to provide additional therapy, there was a some improvement in the chronic phase, but it wasn't as significant, which tends to, to fit with the idea that patients don't improve nearly as much in the chronic phase as they do in the subacute phase. And so increased therapy had the greatest impact in upper extremity in the uh, subacute phase. All right, so that's standardization of care. Um, we're still working on it. It's still a work in progress, but there's pretty much agreement that this is what we need to do. Everybody's kind of bought in. It's just a matter of trying to operationalize all of it. Um, and this is not just um, true here, it's true around most of the developed world. Um, and most of the places where I go to lecture, I present this talk and, um, and people are all having the same issues. So the, the big thing that everybody asked me, and it's the reason for wanting to do this presentation and some of the research we're doing is the trouble is nobody's quite sure now what we do after standardized rehab care. And, and you, can, you, you can really feel it out there. I mean, there was a lot of buzz um, up until about seven or eight years ago with this whole idea of standardized care and a real sense that we were moving forward and a real excitement around stroke rehabilitation and that we were building something really big. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that. I think there's a lot of really cool things that have happened, particularly in Ontario, when you compare it to the other provinces. There's been some really tremendous things happening and we've really made a big difference in patient care, but we always wanna try and get better. We don't wanna sit on our laurels. We always wanna try and improve upon what we're doing. And so right now, the big question is, where do we go next? And, and one of the, the things that one can start off with is looking at what are some of the limits to standardized care. And one of them is that our patients vary dramatically, right? They vary in their impairments, their disabilities, their motivations, their supports, the size and location of their stroke, and their response to rehab. And, and you know, as, as therapists, um, you all have to react and deal and with that based on your experience. And so there's a lot of, right now, that's where it all happens. It happens in a, in a ad hoc way, but it's done by therapists with experience who, who model their treatment programs to their patients and deal with that heterogeneity. But it's not done in a particularly formal way. Um, and so those are some of the things we can start thinking about how we, we start dealing with some of that heterogeneity um, using some of the evidence that's out there. 
And the second thing is that there's a very impressive and growing evidence base in stroke rehab, particularly with regard to what we call adjunct therapies. Um, and yet the use of those adjunct therapies remains largely ad hoc or absent, particularly in a North American framework. Um, and the same thing is true in Europe. You go to Asia, uh, the advanced Asian countries, Korea, Singapore, they use a lot of adjunct therapies and they, they've really moved forward a lot more quickly with those types of things, in part because they're new to the game. So they've kind of jumped on the evidence a lot harder because they don't, they don't have the same traditions that we have. Um, but, but certainly in North America and Europe, there's, there's really a, a bit of struggle in trying to, how do we apply all these additional therapies? Um, and so our, our focus on those has been largely on an ad hoc basis. All right. So the real, I think the real future of stroke rehab, now that we've sort of developed the idea of standardization and know where we're going there, is the idea of now moving to more personalized or customized stroke rehabilitation. And people have begun to talk about this in a number of areas of medicine in general, um, but one in particular in stroke rehabilitation, the idea that we need to develop more personalized or customized stroke rehab care. And it, it comes with a wide variety of examples. Um, benchmarking, which has dramatically improved care on outcomes in Ontario, in particular, you look at Ontario compared to many of the other provinces, huge differences in terms of the, quanti the quality and the efficiency of care that we provide. And a lot of it can be accounted for by the benchmarking that we've been doing, the, the AFPs and all that sort of stuff, the quality improvement, where we're actually audited for what we do. Um, continuity of care is really big. I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but the early supported discharge work showed that, you know, doing those, those warm handoffs where, you know, you, you really are, there's a careful interaction between the therapists who are moving to the next level of care, or providing care at the next level um, with the people that have provided care at the, the uh, earlier level is really, really important to better outcomes. Um, the better the communication is, for instance, from inpatients to outpatients, the better the outcome will actually be. So communication is something that we sometimes don't take as important as it is. Biomarkers are hot. You know, whenever you get a basic scientist involved in anything rehab, they all seem to like biomarkers. I don't know why, but biomarkers are 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 um, are potentially ways that we can predict who's going to do better. Um, something like a transcranial magnetic stimulation can examine the intactness of the cortical spinal tract and tell you whether that patient's going to improve a lot, and you need to put a lot more resources in them versus not. New Zealanders have really um, um, uh, uh, highlighted this work. I'm not going to talk a lot about it because right now the magnetic stimulators are still only experimental in Canada. Patient preferences, motivation, and psychosocial factors are important, as are use of adjunct therapies. I'm going to focus on those. And then evidence-based algorithms are, um, are things that uh, we've been involved in, but I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But they're ways of trying to incorporate adjunct therapies in more of an algorithmic fashion. We haven't developed enough expertise, though, to develop a lot of really good algorithms. And then finally, time post-stroke and stroke severity allow us to personalize care, and we do that on the ward all the time. So the two things I'm going to talk about are patient preferences, motivation, and psychosocial factors, because I think those are things we can, we can change now, and then the use of adjunct therapies. So in terms of patient preferences and motivation, um, just to let you know, those things matter, and there's been a building research on how important those factors are in terms of rehabilitation. And intuitively, although we know that, um, how do we better utilize um, our practices in order to take advantage or to speak to those issues? And this is an interesting study. I mean, hospitals, the way we've currently designed them, and, and the model of care that we use for stroke rehab was, was, was developed back in the 60s, and it hasn't changed a lot. But hospitals can be very restrictive and demotivating. And this is a study that's been duplicated in other places, but I chose this one. This was um, done by Simpson et al., I believe in Melbourne, Australia. And it's an observational study of 34 stroke patients. And what they did was they put an activity monitor on them and they wore it continuously to see how active they were up and about. And they, 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 they wore it continuously for their, their last week in hospital and their first week at home. So back to back. And what they found was that when patients went home, they spent more time upright and walking and less time sitting. In other words, they were consistently a lot more active across all of the patients at home, the week they went home, than the, the last week they were in hospital. 
Now, when you think about it, that's quite remarkable for a rehab unit. But you can see how it happens, you know? But it makes you think, and, I, and I'll throw this out there for people to consider, how did it get so that patients are less active on a rehab unit than they are at home? Or they're, yeah, less active on a rehab unit than they are immediately on going home. That, that speaks to a lot of concerns. Maybe it's we're over-concerned about falling. You know, we keep saying our administrators, like falling is part of rehab. Like, I'm sorry, but, you know, we got to put our patients at risk in order to get them up and going. Like, it's just part of rehab. Um, and that's saying, you know, we're not the same as the, the, the patient who just had their, um, their uh, knee replaced. Or, or their their appendix out or whatever. Um, so I think there's perhaps safety over concerns. Paperwork, uh, we spend too much time on that perhaps. Motivation, culture, I don't know. Um, it actually argues very strongly for getting them out of the unit as soon as possible, when you think about it, and up and about, um, because they're more up and about when they go home than they are in the rehab unit. And this data is not new. This data has been repeated in a number of different spots now. And, and, and makes you think about how can we improve upon what we're doing in terms of getting people up and going. And then um, non-use behaviors, then a lot of attention paid to that as well. One of the more challenging tasks um, in dealing with um, recovery, as you know, is use, um, is non-use or limited use of the affected extremity. And, 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 and Kramer, and this work's been, been again duplicated as well, found that 27% of patients who made a full recovery on the Fugelmeyer score. Um, so they made a full recovery as best they could be determined, um, reported reduced hand use in ADL activities. So, you know, he found this really quite remarkable that a quarter of the patients who made a full recovery still would not use their hand as much in ADL activities after they um, uh, were completing their rehab. And he, he thought that this non-use behavior could be explained by limited expectations and confidence for self-success success, and appeared to be related to patient self-efficacy. So something we need to pay a lot of attention to, um, you know, patients' um, confidence and their, their ability to think they can do something is really, really important for whether they follow through using what we teach them on rehabilitation. And this was particularly brought out with the constraint-induced movement therapy movement. As I'll show you later, there's been a ton of studies on constraint-induced movement therapy. It's a fantastic treatment. Um, and, and motor improvements are seen when patients are forced to perform tasks with the paretic arm. Um, and so with constraint induced movement therapy, as you know, you tie up the good arm for specific patients that are already making a, a fairly significant recovery. And then you use a forced use paradigm to make them do tasks with the paretic arm and really fast forward or fast feed them in terms of improving their function with that uh, paretic arm. But what this study showed that those changes when they were forced to perform the task with the paretic arm were seldom generalized into the home environment. So they would do them on the rehab unit because they were made to as part of their treatment, but oftentimes they would not generalize that same forced paradigm into the home environment. The one exception was um, when Goche, I think she's in Cincinnati now, uh, but she was with um, um, uh, the group in Birmingham, at, at, at Alabama at the time, was when they developed a transfer package. And the transfer package was, um, not only did they work on the um, 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 constraint-induced movement therapy, but then they were very, very careful and specific and, and um, focused on making sure that patients understood that they wanted to use it when they went home. They had to use it when they got, they had to do the same thing when they went home and they had to use, practice the tame task with the affected arm when they were at home. And then they went home with them and practiced that. So the idea was we're not only going to do the constraint induced movement therapy, but we're going to make sure that they are able to then generalize it to use when they went home. And under those circumstances, patients continue to use it when they went home versus when they just practice it on the rehab unit. And I think it really highlights the importance of linking patients' preferences, values, and perceptions to their goals of practice. And it really highlights the importance of outpatient therapy, in particular, community-based outpatient therapy. And otherwise, our patients are at risk of suffering a decline in their function over time through non-use. This is particularly true in the upper extremity. And then finally, just to end this part, um, and this is a study we did, 
um, on the importance of psychosocial factors. We looked at, at psychosocial factors in severe stroke rehab patients. This is one of my grad students um, um, uh, produced this study. Um, we got a several, several um, nice, nice results from it. But we found that severe, as you know, severe stroke patients are really difficult and they take longer to achieve the same functional gains with traditional rehab approaches. And one of the things we wanted to study was what was the role of the family with the severe stroke patient? And we were really quite surprised at the results. Uh, 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 we are and we aren't, um, but a supportive family and resources really becomes critical, particularly for severe stroke patients. For instance, we found that if you, if you were a severe stroke patient and you did not have a supportive family, you didn't go home, full stop. You just did not. Um, and of those that had a caregiver, 80% um, went home. Um, so, but those without a caregiver never went home. They, they went to institutional care. Interestingly, the thing that we were really surprised about though, was that the individuals with a caregiver, even after you accounted for every other factor, severity, et cetera, et cetera, depression, et cetera, individuals with caregivers were found to make much greater fin gains. So the fact that they had a caregiver really did result in significant fin gains. Now, when we asked the, 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 the staff why that was, they said it's obvious that the um, uh, caregivers are motivating the patient. When we asked the caregivers, it says it's obvious that we're motivating the therapist. So it was a, <laughs> an interesting dichotomy. Um, but regardless, and I think it's probably a bit of both, um, those people that had caregivers made significant FIM gains and were likely to go home. And it just points out just how important the family is and caregivers are to the outcomes, particularly when our patients have more severe strokes. All right. And so the final thing I want to talk a bit about adjunct therapies. And as you know, I talked about how adjunct therapies are well studied, but not well used. And this just shows you, and I don't want you to remember all this stuff, but I, I just wanna impress upon you. This is for the upper extremity alone. This is only up to April, 2021. There are actually 1,286 randomized controlled trials um, up to April, 2021, which means there's now 1,500 randomized controlled trials looking at just the upper extremity motor recovery. It's really quite, it's really quite impressive. And, and, of those trials, about 15% cover what we currently do um, as part of standardized care. The other 85% covered things like constraint-induced movement therapy, virtual reality, robotics, neuromuscular electrical stim, mirror therapy, bilateral arm training, et cetera, et cetera, all these other adjunct therapies. So with these adjunct therapies, we have tremendous evidence base, and that's really, really important. And so we, uh, you know, one of the things we came up with is, well, we didn't know people weren't applying it. Well, maybe it's because they don't have a framework to apply those adjunct therapies. So we decided we'd develop a framework and there are a number of ways you can approach this, but the way we did it was we chose the idea of primers and facilitators. And primers are those things that stimulate the brain and get the brain ready for recovery or get the things ready for treatment. So things like action observation, mirror therapy, mental imagery, uh, bilateral arm therapy, music therapy, virtual reality, RTM, the, the, the brain stimulators, which are not yet approved, but will be shortly, pharmacological treatment, or the facilitators, which were things like constraint-induced movement therapy, FES, which is one of the ones that is actually used a fair bit, uh, robotic aid, sensory stimulation, and strength training. Um, and with this framework, we presented the idea that um, therapists should be encouraged to utilize maybe one primer and one facilitator in addition to standard practice to improve motor recovery. A lot of them have very strong evidence that they work, but one of the things we don't have a good feel for yet is who do they work best for who? Uh, what, what group of patients benefit the most from what particular intervention? And, and, and I think one of the things that reason we developed our, our concept that therapists could be encouraged to use one primer and one facilitator was that we could start developing some clinical expertise that would then help to advise us as to how to best apply the evidence um, in a clinical setting, because that's one of the challenges we have. All right, and this is just a final thing. We, we actually um, have been doing these things called network meta-analyses. Um, basically, it's a, a way of trying to compare different therapies in terms of their efficacy 
Um, it's a very challenging thing to do because we have so much heterogeneity in terms of outcome measures and the, the different interventions that we use, the different control groups that we have. But because there's so much data for upper extremity post-stroke, we were able to find 176 randomized controlled trials that actually examined 20 adjunct uh, interventions that had a, a conventional care as their control group and used the Fubelmeyer assessment as their um, motor um, outcome measure. And, and this is what we found. It's really quite fascinating. Um, we found that modified constraint-induced movement therapy, um, if added to treatment, uh, conventional care, improved the Fugelmeyer score by about 6.7 points. And it's important to realize that this actually is above the Fugelmeyer minimally clinically important difference. And that means it's not only statistically significant, but it's significant from a patient evaluation standpoint. So patients have stated that if the Fugelmeyer is more than four points, it actually is beneficial to them. And so things like um, uh, high frequency repetitive tra uh, uh, tragnetic stimulation we don't have yet also had a significant and, and, and clinically significant difference. Mental imagery did, uh, bilateral arm training. So you can start seeing we're developing an idea that there are certain interventions that can be beneficial for patients and begin to rate them as to which ones are the most um, likely to be effective. Things like robotics weren't effective at all. And that's the other thing that really stands out. Now, the challenge with all this is that these used all of the literature. So it looked at patients at both the acute, subacute, and chronic phase. And in fact, half the studies came from the chronic phase. And one of the problems with the chronic phase is you don't see the degree of improvement with the chronic phase as you see in the subacute phase. And so we did a subset analysis um, and this is kind of reversed with the, the most powerful being at the bottom, a subset analysis using the same kind of technology or same kind of analysis, looking at what were the Fugelmeyer score changes in, uh, in a number of these interventions involving the upper extremity. And again, you can see really dramatic changes. Now the Fugelmeyer score is 11 points higher. And if you apply these treatments in the subacute phase, things like constraint-induced movement therapy, bilateral arm training, FES, uh, some of the stimulations, uh, action observation, mirror therapy, those kinds of things all start to see a real significant benefit as well. And so in terms of um, summary of my talk, um, stroke rehab has the strongest evidence-based in neurorehabilitation. Um, first principles in stroke rehab now are generally agreed upon and established as a standardized practice. Operationalizing them is still a bit of a challenge, but you know we know what we have to do. It's just a matter of trying to do it. Um, personalized or customized care is increasingly possible now based upon best evidence. Um, I think the primers and facilitators approach provides an approach to introducing adjunct therapies into stroke rehab care. And we need to develop evidence-based guidelines and algorithms to determine use of adjunct therapy in stroke rehabilitation. And, and I'll just finish by, you know, I co-chaired the last two, um, two um, Canadian stroke guidelines and the new ones are starting, are, are there, we're in the process of doing them now. I'm not the chair anymore. I just provide the evidence. And, and you know, the, the guidelines are not particularly helpful here because what the guidelines will say is they'll say, consider this. So we need to like keep saying to the people in the guidelines, we need to get a little more specific in terms of, you know, trying to provide people with advice as to where we can go next. Um, and so that's another challenge that we have. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bob. At this time, I'd like to open it up to the teams and to our participants if we have any questions regarding uh, what Dr. Tizo uh, presented to us this afternoon. Can we use the chat um, to bring forward those questions? That's great. Just give some time for people to type. I just, I was just telling Eileen, um, and I'll just mention that we did a big survey of adjunct therapies across Canada, um, and we studied very carefully how much were being used, and it kind of confirmed what we thought. Um, the technologies are, are, are people are aware of them, but they're not really applying them um, at this point. Uh, although there's a great deal of interest in doing so. Um, one of the things that we found was that the areas where 
where adjunct therapies are starting to be applied more often is in the outpatient clinic. Um, the inpatient unit, I think, has some unique challenges in that they got to get patients up and going and out the door, and I get that. <laughs> you know, you don't have as much time to fool around. Like, I got, I got 28 days to get you up and going and out the door as good as you can be. Um, and, uh, and, and, but in an outpatient setting, they're already starting to plateau. Everybody's looking at trying to try something new and there's less of an, uh, a push, like I got to get them out the door. So there's the, the opportunity then to start experimenting with things more. So, you know, that is one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, the outpatient clinic seems to be a source of experimentation at present. Thanks, Bob. We're starting to get some uh, questions coming into the chat. So I'm just going to um, start. Tammy has asked, which adjunct therapies have been routinely adopted? Maybe you can cite Parkwood as an example. Uh, Parkwood's a, Parkwood, like everybody else, has the similar challenges we talked about. Um, and I would say looking at Parkwood in terms of which one is most likely uh, adjunct is applied is FES. Um, by far, FES is by far the most common. Um, Otherwise, we're struggling with the same issues everybody else is. Um, we've just started a big center here, a big activity center. So we've just bought our first two RTMS machines. Um, we're developing a, a, a large um, um, a, a, a series of other um, specific equipments we want to start using. But we're still struggling with finding the time on the inpatient unit to begin to do these types of therapies. And so I would say the one that's most often utilized by far is the FES, um, including the FES bike. Now we're using a fair bit and FES in general. And Bob, maybe just to clarify on the RTMS, we don't have it yet approved in Canada. So at Parkwood, the approval um, for it, is that more research-based? Is that how you're getting to utilize it? It's research-based. Um, and as you know, it is, it is, it is, it is used a lot in London for depression, for severe depression. Yeah. Um, we can also, um, starting to utilize it to see if we can detect the cortical spinal tract being intact or not, just starting to play around with that idea a bit. Um, but again, more in a, an experiential has to path through ethics type of setting at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we certainly have seen the evidence and the research and the excitement with the biomarkers and the utilization of RTMS to confirm an intact cortical spinal tract. Uh, um, RTMS, RTMS has been shown to help everything. Swallowing, yeah. speech, motor recovery, like, and, and when I was in Korea, they were, they were just using it on everybody, um, you know, um, I was a bit concerned because it just seemed to be everybody. I wasn't even sure that they had good protocols, to be honest with you. Um, but they were very keen on experimenting and trying with it and, and, and actually have been one of the leading research centers as well. Great. So that was going to be my question because I know um, it's just, it's coming in, it's coming to the States and that's what they're starting to have that cross application for. Do you have a sense at all where it might be for us to begin to use it here in Canada? Just because well, there, it's one of the key adjunct therapies that I think would be. There's a, a huge, take. there's a huge RTMS group that's developed, experimental group across the country. We're doing trials now that heart stroke is pouring lots of money into. Um, and so where we've just joined that group. So they're all doing all these research trials on it. Um, so that's number one. Number two is the amount of studies that have been done are just like through the roof, right? I mean, there's probably 400 RTMS studies when you add them all up across all the different, uh, um, uh, different types of um, uh, deficits that people have, be they speech swallowing upper and lower extremity. It's it's surprising how many studies have been done for something that still is not yet approved. And this is, um, somebody just hasn't got around to doing it. It's the problem. I think this is part of the challenge is we don't have the same, remember when we had the Canadian Stroke Network and all that stuff, we had a lot more push. And I think this is something really we need to get uh, some sort of group uh, involved in, maybe heart and stroke or something like that, to take this as a, a, a key thing they want to move forward on. Because there's no reason it shouldn't be approved. 
That's right, because we know the longstanding application of RTMS with depression. And so that is certainly another another area from a stroke rehab but one, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, you know, for instance, I was in Malaysia. Remember, we had a, a fellow from there. So and Malaysia is an interesting place because in Kuala Lumpur, they have all the all the all the fancy equipment and all the bells and whistles. But they have a lot of smaller centers that don't and they don't have a lot of money. And I said, you know, but if you're looking at it from a primer standpoint, you don't have to do RTMS. You can do mirror therapy. You know, and you can do action observation. You can do um, um, mental imagery. And they have almost the same effect in terms of uh, the impact on outcomes. So it doesn't have to be expensive technology. It can be cheap stuff as well. It could be just other ways trying to get at how do I get the brain primed? Right. Um, and so it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be this high technology stuff. You know, when I would go see patients, they'd say, how can I improve myself, doctor? And I'd say, practice moving your arm. We'd sit down for five minutes and talk about how you practice moving your arm in your head, right? Much like you would do in sports medicine. Um, you know, just little things like that, that the studies show make a difference and we don't take advantage of. Right. And then certainly with my my experience with constraint induced movement therapy is that for a lot of patients initially it's very frustrating to have to not use your good hand and try and practice with your affected hand. Right. With with what you're seeing in the research, have you seen any further uptake in CIMT, knowing that we're seeing this high valued significant change? Well, CIMT has specific criteria. And I think one of your chat people have determined that, you know, based mm -hmm. on the studies, there has to be some recovery of the upper arm, right? They have yes. to get some function in their hand. But it has surprisingly been very not well adopted in a clinical setting. And everybody's commenting on this. Like, this is a big, hot topic right now. Why isn't it being adopted clinically? Um, and my experience is, Patients don't necessarily like it. <laughs> you have to really sell it, right? Yeah. And you have to really sell it and how important it is. And, you know, the spouse gets on them and, and you know, it's frustrating for them at first. It's not that easy to do. Um, it's not fun like the other things that we do, right? And so mm -hmm. you really have to sell it. And I find that that's been the hard part is getting therapists to sell it. Um, because patients won't do it on their own. Right. Fair enough. And for some um, reason, it doesn't resonate with therapists. It doesn't. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 it's just not me. Um, people are talking about this as perhaps one of the, the greatest tools in stroke rehab that never gets used. <laughs> yeah. So maybe now knowing what um, your research is highlighting, maybe this is something that we can resurface. I'm seeing the question in the chat. Um, so we know that there's the criteria, also the time of treatment for standard uh, CIMT was very long. Can anyone comment on its use in an inpatient setting? So aside um, from what you've just said, I don't know if there's a thumbs up from anybody who's been using it that we can get a sense of or... Um, is it basically not being well utilized? And maybe this is um, something that we want to talk about today. It's a, it's an amazing tool, especially with neglect patients. Like, whoa, you know, like I've seen some just amazing cases with neglect patients. But, you know, I have to say when I would, when I would say, you know, this, this is a good patient for CIMT. Everybody would look at me and roll their eyes. And I always knew I was in trouble then. <laughs> yeah. And, I'm, and, and I hear that all from everybody. It's not just my center, it's everybody. Um, for some reason, it's just not been easily adopted. And maybe we don't train people well. I don't know. Um, but it, it's such a, when you think about it, it's a pretty simple treatment. The whole, and oh. I, you know, and the nice thing is you, you build in the concept that you need to use both arms with patients. Like, the importance of practicing me with the unaffected arm because if left to their own they often don't because it's inefficient and get things done more quickly or the family member will well you know it just takes too long to eat so like i gotta get moving here so you mm -hmm. know let's use the good hand so if you begin to push it though in terms of a, a treatment that 
could improve you because everybody's always asked me how can I get better how can I get better and I say you know take your good hand and put it in your pocket right and start using your found affected arm and then they all kind of look at you and go uh, you know and some will try it and some won't but um, unfortunately it for some reason it hasn't caught on as much as you would think it would based on the evidence and the simplicity of it Right. And I think the other pieces in that transfer package that you were alluding to in your presentation, it's also about the education and informing the family and the care partners at home. So that piece continues as well. So and practicing it, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it, it's, 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 you know, it, it becomes a habit, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at some more questions. So maybe I can um, start from Jen has this question from Joe Brandt. You talked about ensuring to incorporate patient preference to tap into motivation. Any specifics on the areas that are most impactful in terms of what to get to know? Yeah, this is a good question. I mean, I, I think you know, we've talked about this before, you know, rehab units need to be stimulating and they're not, you know, uh, when you look at the amount of time that patients spend in bed, it's kind of frightening. Um, so we need, and if you look at how rehab units are designed, they're not always designed to be user-friendly. They're not always designed to be uh, welcoming to caregivers. You know, we've talked about that many times. Um, they're, they're, they're not like stimulating places. Um, there aren't things that they can do in their spare time to maybe work on things. Part of that is legal requirements. I, I remember one of the Dutch guys um, tried to put a stationary bicycle on the in the hallway, right? So patients could use it when they had spare time and the lawyers made them take it down. <laughs> and I think it comes down to asking what matters to patients, right? Um, mm -hmm. You need to sit down and specifically ask them, what do you want to do and how do you want to get to where you want to go. And I think we do that to some extent, um, but we need to understand how important it is to get them up and, uh, and going according, or, or, or focusing on the things that they consider to be the most important. For most patients, I want to get up and walk. You know that, right? Yeah. For most patients, I want to get walking. Here's another question from Joe Brandt. When trying different adjunct therapies, how long do you try before moving on to something else? I do not know the answer to that question. I think that's one of the reasons we want people to start trying because we need to figure this out, right? So, you know, the studies generally run for two to four weeks um, worth of treatment. Um, I would say at least two weeks before you determine uh, that it, it's not, you may not be feeling it's helping. But, you know, I don't think we, we know the answer to that because we haven't been doing these things in a clinical basis. And so one of the reasons for the way we designed the, the, the framework was to try and give therapists the freedom to pick one of these and use which one they thought their patient would benefit from, gain the experience with that tool, and then determine whether the next patient would benefit or I should try something else. You know, that, that would be huge. If we could start, and then that experience starts to be passed on and onto the researchers and onto others, that would really, I think, be a game changer. So start now and contribute to the knowledge pool. We have a lot of evidence, but as you know, it's, 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 it sounds impressive when they do randomized controlled trials, but randomized controlled trials have very tight inclus inclusion criteria. They're very artificial type settings and their, their generalizability to the clinical world is not all that easy. You know, it's not always as easy as you think it would be. Evidence, well, it's evidence. Tell me what evidence I have to practice, but it doesn't quite work like that. So being able to combine that understanding of what the evidence says with then developing clinical expertise is really where the, I think the game changer is where we'll really see real change occur. Um, and that's why we, we don't tell people what, what primer or what facilitator they should use. That's up to the individual therapist to determine based upon how they evaluate their patient because they know their patients well, right? And they're not, they, they're well experienced, what they think might work. And then, to rel and then to build on that experience, continue to try new things or, you know, redo the things that worked. Mm -hmm. 
For sure. Yeah, because I can't help but think as we try with a certain adjunct therapy, you try it on a certain type of patient or patient profile, learn what that outcomes are there, and then do you try it again on somebody similar or a different type of patient profile and build and add to that clinical knowledge pool. If we don't start Stand somewhere, we won't, we won't be able to move it forward. Standardized care was easy, relatively speaking, because it was straightforward. You do this, do this, do this, do this, but it was standardized, right? It was trying mm -hmm. to make sure everybody got the same care in a group of patients where one size doesn't fit all. Now we're into trying to be more, more, um, what do we call it? Um, you know, where, where the care is more personalized to that patient. And again, therapists do that all the time, right? You, you don't treat a severe stroke patient the same as a mild stroke patient. You treat them different and, and therapists have to make those judgments and make those changes all the time. So this process is always going on all the time. So it's not like this never occurs. It occurs all the time. We're just trying to then also incorporate these adjunct therapies into that conceptualization of providing specific care to a specific patient's needs. Great. Our next question um, comes from Hamilton uh, General. With the challenges of staffing ratios, how can we find the time to incorporate adjunct therapies? Uh, you know, it, it, it's the answer to that is obvious. You can't. I hate to say it, but you can't because if you're on an inpatient unit, you have 28 days to get that patient out the door and you can't be fooling around, right? You got to get them up. You got to get moving as fast as you can. And so you do adjunct therapies if you think that can speed that process up, but you certainly don't have the time to experiment with those treatments realistically. This is one of our challenges, right? If we're going to ask people to do adjunct therapies, there has to be some time provided to do those. Because now in an outpatient setting, it's different. You're at a different stage. Patients are starting to, to plateau. You're going to try something different. You don't have the same imperative. I got to get them well enough to go home. You know what I mean? Um, and so I would argue that if you don't have a reasonable um, staff ratio, you're going to struggle with applying adjunct therapies. That's just the real life. So then is the opportunity um, to have support from leadership administration to begin to pilot and say, as a team, we're interested in beginning adjunct therapies, recognizing there's a learning curve, it takes a bit more time, and to get that support and buy-in, because we're all struggling with staffing compliments right now. Um, and whether or not even pre-pandemic we had um, best practice ratios or not, it's how are we going to be able to move stroke rehab forward for better outcomes and efficiencies in the long run if we don't start advocating for the opportunity now. And I would also say in outpatients, they are also time limited. I appreciate the person isn't staying over in the in in the inpatient unit, but they too are on on a um, recommended target time period for their outpatient therapies. I do think there are advantages though. I mean, you know, number one is you're investing in your staff. Number two is people are doing new things that are exciting. Um, you're more likely to retain people if they feel they're in a place that does new things and is bringing new things to bear. You know what I mean? There's this, this, mm -hmm. this, uh, you've heard me say this before that, that, that sense of, um, you know, we're something special here. We got something cool going on, you know, that's different than elsewhere. Those are powerful things for building um, the, the staff morale and are very powerful things for retaining people. People feel they're in a place that's really moving forward. It's much easier to be attracting people to that kind of a model. And sure. I think in the end, it's the, you know, we're, we're always looking for ways how we can make patient care better. And so this is one potential option to provide better outcomes to patients. So recognizing the challenge, how, how do we make the most of that time with our inpatients to try adjunct therapies and create new, new opportunities for sure? Yes, yes.
All right, another question that's come from Hamilton General. Any recommendation to streamline patients with severe strokes and no caregivers going home from acute to rehab unit, knowing that only 3% will be likely going home? And we certainly have seen a lot in the evidence about the difference that a well care partner makes to, to those individuals who do go home's long-term outcomes. So you know, it comes, any suggestion? It comes, it comes down to how you spend your resources. And so, you know, you're... Your older severe stroke patient, who, and this is an ethical issue, you know, this, this starts to border on, you know, you get into quite very um, heated discussions on this one, I'll be honest with you. But, you know, if you're, if you're going to, to, I'll give you an example, if you've got a, an older pa stroke patient who doesn't have a family, who's had a severe stroke, should they be rehabbed? And we get into this debate, everybody gets into this debate all the time. And people say, well, you know, maybe we'll teach him how to transfer better. That's always the argument, right? We'll teach him how to transfer better. And so he'll be better when he goes to the nursing home. And the challenge is when he gets to the nursing home, they hire them. They don't transfer anybody like that, right? They hire them all. Um, and so the patient ends up losing all those skills. You've invested $25,000, $30,000 on them and really haven't changed their outcome. You know, when you... Re you spend that resource, that's money you can't spend on somebody else. And so this might be part of the hard decisions people have to make with regard to who comes on to rehab. And you and I, as you know, because we worked together for quite a while, had these discussions all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always reluctant to take a severe, older stroke patient, particularly older. Younger is always a, a, a different different uh, discussion, but there aren't many of those. Older stroke patient who doesn't have family who's had a severe stroke, knowing I'm not going to get them home. Right? So what, what am I doing here? You know, why are we doing rehab? What's our goal? And as you know, rehab's all about goals. And that's a tough decision to have. That's a tough discussion to have because they still, they may not have a caregiver, but they still might be somebody's grandpa, right? Or grandma. And so those are really hard decisions to make, but I'm coming more and more to the feeling that, that if we're going to maximize our resources, those patients, we have to really seriously consider not rehabbing. Okay. Um, and there's a question here again um, from Hamilton General. As we know, intensity is important. Is there any advocacy regionally to increase therapy staff, the ratios in our inpatient or outpatient public settings to reach the intensity time to apply adjunct therapies? You know, the governor general just put out a report in Ontario and mm -hmm. said, it's really bad, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Like we need to get better. And most of the problem appears to be, I would argue, the ratios, you know, although in some cases it's just centers not paying attention. But in many cases, it's ratio issue. And, you know, there was there should have been a huge uproar and people should have said, this is bad. We need to fix this. You know, I never heard much. You know what I mean? Uh, crickets, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of centers saying, well, they didn't measure us right. Um, maybe that's true, you know, because they didn't measure the aids we have and stuff like that to the same extent. But so I, I, I don't know what more we can do, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I would have thought that looking on that, hospitals would have reacted to it and would have would have increased the ratios to try and meet those goals because the Auditor General had identified it as a problem, but apparently not. Well, what I can share with you in the Central South region, we did create an advocacy document. Um, all of the leaders um, here today have that document. The original first uh, steps were to speak to it within their internal organization with the leaders um, to see where that opportunity would, would come from internally if there was opportunity. Uh, of course, realistically, that involves um, budget um, and shifting. Sometimes it's robbing Peter to pay Paul um, internally. But the next step was to see if there was consensus within our own Central South region to then take it forward and go to Core Health Ontario Health 
and begin advocacy at that level to see if they are able to be a voice on our behalf to make a difference and start to look at those ratios. Because we know across the entire province, the dot hasn't moved on rehab intensity for years. And no, it it's hasn't. very evident. And that's now, what the Attorney General also brought up in their report. One, one, so, of the real, one of the real challenges is that there are some patients that can't tolerate it. And that's always the argument you get. And it's a fair argument. Like it's a true argument. And I say, Fine, I don't have a problem with that. But then those patients that do should get it. You know, so okay. you always get the argument of, you know, um, not everybody can tolerate the three hours. And I go, okay, then your other patients that can tolerate should be getting that extra therapy. You know what I mean? So that, you know, and maybe, you know, a, a, a proper compromise that makes sense is that we ensure that those patients that can manage three hours get three hours, you know? Um, that would be realistic. I and mean, everything's about being realistic, right? You have these great ideas, but you know, if they're not realistic, they never happen. And so, but there are a group of patients we know that can tolerate three hours and they don't get it. Um, and that's maybe where we need to refocus. That's that would be something that would be sellable, I would think. For sure. And the last question that I see here in the chat, do you know of any private clinics that offer adjunct therapies in the province? I just know that we there are, um, and we have one called New Physio here, um, and it, you have to pay, um, but they offer a wide variety. They're trained in uh, uh, robotics, so you know a lot of their patients have purchased exoskeletons. A lot of them have pu pu purchased their own. You can buy a kit for transcranial direct um, uh, electrical stimulation, um, and so there are a lot of private clinics that are utilizing it, utilizing these adjunct therapies because they bring in business, yeah. right? Um, and you'll see that sometimes with the American hospitals who are competing with each other, they'll offer adjunct therapies as a way of bringing in business. Um, but we don't, we don't have a lot of private care, but where private care does exist, you'll, you know, particularly if it's neurology focused, you'll start seeing a lot of use of adjunct therapies. Sure. That's great. I think that's brought us to an end of the questions. I'm just checking. Yes, it looks like we've had everything answered. So at this time, um, we're doing great. We're right on schedule. So again, thank you so much, Bob, for um, sharing and presenting with us and for your thoughts in, in response to these questions.